We're continuing our discussions around AQ, adversity quotient, with someone who has, well, faces it every single day, both professionally and personally. I first met her last year when we talked about a condition her son has called Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Lucien Mirabi is with us today. She's also a professional negotiator in her day-to-day life as well. So I want to get your thoughts on that word resilience, if you don't mind, because it's something that we talk about kind of striving towards quite a lot and build resilience in our children. And I feel like it's a little bit misunderstood. And I wondered what that word means to you. Sure. Thanks for having me back. It's great to be on the show, Helen. Um, You know, agility and resilience are often interwined and often used as if it's the same word, but there's a big difference. When we're talking about agility, agility is this capacity, whether it's physical or mental, to adapt, to change, to whether it's physical or mental, to completely shift course and to um, accept the change that is happening and go with it. Resilience at the other end is once adversity hits and knocks you down, it's this capacity to stand back up. So there's a difference, but when we combine both strengths, when we are able to and accept what is happening, which we often don't want, right? Mm. Naturally, we are wired to resist change. So when we have the skill to accept the change, whether we like it or not, and stand back up from that defeat or that failure or whatever it is that hits us, that then becomes a superpower because whether we want it or not, life is one big change, right? One Mm -hmm. change after the other. Especially now with the globalization, the world is moving so fast. We are aware, thanks to the news, of everything that's happening. So we have to be agile. We have to be resilient because life is not waiting. Life is changing. Can you talk to us a little bit about your profession? What does a negotiator do? Can you talk about some of the skills that you've had to employ in that over the years? Sure. So as a professional negotiator, I'm hired by companies to help them with their high stakes negotiations. It can be sales, procurement, uh, M&A, whatever it is, whenever there are high stakes and they need an external eye and external expertise. That's when I come in and I help them either by training the teams, by negotiating for them or with them. And that's what a professional negotiator does. I'm going to come back to that because I'm curious how your personal life has fed into that. Tell us a little bit about your son and getting that diagnosis of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. We got the diagnosis six years ago. Alex was six years old um, and we were told that he has a disease that is breaking down his muscles. It's progressive. It goes very fast. And basically within a few years, he wouldn't be able to walk anymore. And it's a fatal disease. Mm -hmm. There is no cure yet. Uh, It's 100 percent fatal. So this disease was going to kill him quite early. Average life expectancy today for patients with DMD is about 25 years old. How is his health today, if you don't mind me asking, Lucian? He's 12 years old now. He can't walk anymore. He can't stand anymore. He's full-time in a wheelchair and everything else is declining. So he is, he's starting diff- difficulties drinking a glass of water. That's becoming too heavy. Um, he basically needs help with almost everything by now. When we think about adversity, I think everyone has a different scale and there's certainly no hierarchy of adversity. I mean, it's so personal and so much depends on how we've been brought up to view change to view what might be thrown in our path um but i wanted to ask you a little bit about feeling like a victim having that why that why me Mm. moment is that something that you went through upon that diagnosis and how things have been unfolding with alex over the years or has that never really entered your head oh it did absolutely and i think it's healthy and i think it's okay um i think what i tell my clients always it's it's okay to be down it's just not okay to stay down Mm. And that's where mindset comes in. And that's when decisions come in. Uh, Of course, I went through why me? Why my son? Uh, This is unfair and everything. Until you come to a point where you realize, you know, life's not fair. And who told you that life's supposed to be fair? The problem is not that we're going to have problems. The problem is that we assume we are not going to have problems. (laughs) Like it only happens to others. So you've spoken really beautifully in the past. And I would urge everyone to find the, the YouTube link talking about peace negotiations with yourself. What, mm. what do you mean by that? Can you explain that, that concept and how it's played a role in, in your life over the years, personally and professionally? Sure. So, so my first career was in finance and I had a lot of tough negotiations, became a professional negotiator and thought that you can negotiate yourself out of everything, right? But then we got the diagnosis. And when you get the diagnosis that your child has an incurable disease, How do you negotiate yourself out of that? 
And believe me, I tried. I negotiated with the doctors. I negotiated with God. I negotiated with life. I negotiated with myself. But the disease didn't go away. And that's when I realized the outside conflict that I was resolving was not going to help me this time. And I noticed that if I was going to see life as one big battle that I had to fight everything, it was going to kill me because this disease is stronger than me. And that's when I realized I need to change me and the way I view things. And that's when peace negotiations with myself started. How on earth do you begin to do that? It's one thing to recognize that perhaps a change needs to be made or a different mindset or attitude is beneficial. But you know, to be, you know, changing neural pathways, to be changing, you know, day-to-day habits, big and small. Where did that begin for you and for anyone else who might be facing not necessarily a similar diagnosis, but a similar, you know, a battle to to borrow your word? Yeah. Yeah. Well, when the adversity is so big that you can't resolve it by thinking about it, by coming up with solutions and nobody else can help, you have to go inward because there's no other way. There, there is nobody else to talk to or to look for or to knock on a door for a solution. So when I went inward, I thought, okay, I need to take care of this child and I cannot take care of him if I'm weak, if I'm sad, if I'm knocked out, I have to stand strong. So I didn't even have time to go through the, oh, why me? I, like I had to get up quickly because he needed me. Mm-hmm. So I did this for him. And by changing myself and the way I was looking at life, instead of seeing everything as a battle, I decided instead of getting the guns ready, I put the guns down. I said, no, we're going to resolve this calmly. We're going to go through this with peace because the biggest pain is not the adversity, is not what's happening to you. The biggest pain is created by resisting what's happening to you. Trying to control something that is so beyond your control. That Absolutely. would be exhausting. So when you put the guns down, meaning you're not going to fight something that is bigger than you, you're and, not. And that's not about giving up. That's I think that's a really Absolutely important not. distinction to make. Yes. It's not about giving up. It's about accepting what is. Not fighting what you cannot fight. So you can focus your strength and your energy on what you can influence. Mm-hmm. And what I can influence is his quality of life. Can't influence his quantity of life. Doctors can't even. There's still no cure. But I, as a mother, can influence his quality of life. So that's when peace is so important, because when you do things from a point of acceptance, from a point of calmness, you are so much more powerful than when you're fighting and fighting and resisting. So in that calmness, we made the decision to move to Dubai. We made the decision to give him the best school possible. We made the decision to, you know, transform our house in a way that is now fully adapted to a wheelchair. Those decisions you can't make when, you're, when your head is agitated mm-hmm. and when you're frustrated and when you're angry at life. Can I ask then, in terms of talking to Alex about his diagnosis, because it would be completely inevitable, and he's 12 now, so getting into those teenage years, for him to have anger about his situation. How do you talk to him about it? Well, emotional intelligence is super important. And I talk to him and I ask him very regularly, how do you feel? How do you feel about all this? Um, it's totally normal to be angry because it is unfair. It's true. Um, So we talk about those things. And he is, Helen, extremely wise. Like he's the one teaching me about life, not the other way around. He's extremely wise. And I think the number one thing that he's teaching me is how fast he accepts things. Mm -hmm. So he should be the one speaking here. He should be (laughs) the one speaking about AQ because it's just impressive. Every single time he loses another body function, like there is this tiny moment of sadness and anger and boom. There he is again. Straight into survival mode. Exactly. Lucy Murabi was with us this afternoon. I wanted to ask you about some of the negotiations you have with Alex, you know, as he's getting older and ultimately what you're learning about yourself professionally through those negotiations. Mm. Well, it's a tough one. Honestly, the negotiations I have with Alex are the hardest of my life. Like M&A negotiations next to it is nothing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, it's very difficult because I need to influence him in accepting all the difficult things that he has to do that you don't normally do at 12 years old. Every day physiotherapy, every day aqua therapy, every day going to the physiotherapist. And um, and it's hard and it's tough, but it's inevitable. We have to do this to keep his muscles as strong as possible, as long as possible. And of course, he doesn't feel like doing it. Imagine if somebody forced you to go to the gym every single day and you work hard every single day and yet you become weaker every single day. Like, how do you keep motivation, right? So it's those negotiations that we have constantly. And 
what's the toughest for me is to accept that I'm not the one deciding, but he is. I cannot physically force him to do physiotherapy. So I have to accept that there's a part of influence, but he is the decision maker. And I think that's very important when we're facing adversity to say, who is the decision maker in this? And am I trying to be a decision maker where I'm not? Mm-hmm. Um, we've had a message here and it's not related to family life, but I'm wondering if, if you could perhaps speak to it. Um, and then there's no name on this message and we can always say, you know, be anonymous, it's absolutely fine. Um, but someone's saying that we made, were made redundant last week um, after working for a company for 10 years, feeling I'm completely heartbroken and I'm afraid of the future. Mm. So to this listener, indeed anyone that might have had some shocking or sad news, which my goodness, you you had those six years ago. You talk there about straight getting into action mode and then doing the work on yourself. What advice would you give to any who, anyone who might have had a phone call, an email, a doctor's appointment and has been blindsided by what they found out? Yeah, well, an important part of peace negotiations is empathy. And here it's empathy for yourself. Give yourself some compassion, give yourself some time, allow yourself to grieve because this is what she is go or he is going through right now. It's grieve, grieve of losing the job that they loved or grieve of anything that feels like a loss. Mm. So allow yourself to grieve, allow yourself to cry, allow yourself a few days of I'm not going to do anything and whatever it is that helps you overcoming sadness. Allow the tears, allow anything you want. And then it's how do I stand back up? What do I want now? What does this mean? What is the future? And what is my first need? Is it the recognition that the job was giving me? Is it finances? Is it what is it that I need? And stay connected to your need and try to satisfy that need as soon as possible in the most ethical way, obviously. Thank you so much for coming in again. It's, you're very welcome. I think you're incredible. I really do. And um, sounds like Alex is keeping you on, on your toes mm-hmm. um, moving moving forward. Do you have any recommended resources, I guess, is my final question. Any books or podcasts that have helped you along the years? Or indeed, we'd like people to direct to any of your own resources. You're incredibly influential on LinkedIn on the professional front. But personally, what's helped you? Well, I share a lot on LinkedIn, both professionally and personally. I share about Alex and how I'm dealing with all this. Um, One book that really helped me, and it's a classic, million sold, very old, but still very relevant, is uh, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Um, If you want to read about somebody who went through massive adversity and came out of it, then your own adversity next to it seems so tiny that you're like, okay, if if, if a human being can go through so much adversity and stay positive and optimistic, then for sure I can too. So yeah, Man's Search for Meaning, lovely book. Thank you so, so much. 